opening statement, which says that this is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Princeton Zoning Board of Adjustment, which is being held on Wednesday, the 28th of September, 2016, at 7.35 p.m. in the Municipal Compact. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, uh, adequate notice of the time and place of this regular meeting has been provided by prominently displaying the schedule of regular meetings on the official notice board in the municipal complex and by transmitting a copy of this schedule to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, the Trenton Times, the Trentonian, and to Comcast Cable of New Jersey, Inc. A copy was also filed with the clerk of Princeton. Would you call the roll for us, please, Clayton? Yes, sir. Ms. Clayton? Mr. Cohen? Yes, here. Ms. Colson? Here. Mr. Floyd? Here. Mr. Callaghan? Here. Chairman Royce? Here. Ms. Suri? Mr. Tenable? Here. Thank you. Before we start business, I would like to welcome uh, John Caledon to our number. Uh, he will make this a legal sort of session this evening, so we value his presence very much. As you're well aware, we've got a lot of housekeeping to do before we really come to the cases in hand. We have to uh, authorize or memorialize some resolutions and findings of fact. So we'll start um, with the minutes of uh, the 16th of March. Uh, these were circulated and I think available on the web as well. Uh, are there any uh, comments, changes, amendments needed, or are these acceptable as presented? If the latter, I'd like a motion to accept and a seconder, and we will vote with a voice vote on that. Move to approve the minutes. We have a move to approve as I'll presented. Is there a seconder I'll for second. that? We have a seconder for that. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Thank you. Good. Um, now we have the findings of fact. Um, the first one being for 159 Snowden Lane. That has the file number Z1515179V. Uh, v Again, these were circulated to us. If there are any comments or changes required, either by the people to whom it applies or from members of the board, now is the time. If not, Again, a motion to accept. I move to accept. We have a motion to accept, a seconder. I'll second that. We have a seconder. And since our attorney knows who can vote on it, she will call the roll. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Coulson? Yes. Mr. Fienenbaum? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Approved. The uh, next one of the findings of fact is 194 Linden Lane, which carries the file number Z1616363UV. Same procedure. I move to accept. We have I second. a motion to accept as presented. Second. We have a seconder for that motion. Our attorney will decide who can vote. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Tannenbaum? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, 296 Shady Brook Lane, which carries the file number Z1616378V. I move to accept. I have second. A motion to accept and a seconder. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Coulson? Yes. Mr. Tenenbaum? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. 
the penultimate one of these is um, it's not. 38 Hillside Road with the file number Z1616 uh, 38, sorry, 368 UV. Move to accept. A motion to accept is presented. I'll second it. We have a seconder for that motion. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Coulson? Yes. Mr. Tenenbaum? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. And the last in this fascinating sequence uh, is uh, 256 Snowden Lane. Uh, which, with the file number Z161637 u Move to accept. Motion to accept. I second. Oh, oh. Second. Which is, which, we've got a second. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Coulson. Yes. Mr. Tenenbaum. Yep. Chairman Royce. Yes. Okay. So now we come uh, to the applications we are going to hear this evening. Um, the first of these is uh, 397 Cherry Hill Road. It's block 4000, lot 12 in the RB zone and carries the uh, case number Z1515305. UPN. Uh, what I would like to do is to ask Mr. Bridger to read his memorandum into the record. Uh, okay, before we get to that, Mr. Chairman, ah. uh, Richard Schatzman, attorney, I assume the uh, affidavit of publication and the affidavit of service is in order? Yes, I was about to say that it's correct. The board has jurisdiction. Uh, since there's only six members and it's a use variance, I, in 49 years with this board or any other board, I only go with seven members, so we'll have to take jurisdiction and carry it. Um, Mr. Schatzman, uh, we, we, we were expecting one more board member. I'm not sure she's going to make it. Um, would you like us to take another application out of order to see yeah. if she does join us? Yeah. Next one. Yeah, I'll do the next one. I, I have the okay. next one as well. I can't hear you, what you're saying because your microphone is either not in or you're not speaking into it. You're, you're asking to carry the case? Well, Chairman Rose, what, Chairman Rose, what I was suggesting to Mr. Schatzman is uh, we could take the next application out of order. Mr. Schatzman's can't representing that applicant as well, and we'll see if we have another board member join us because we were expecting one more member on the guys. One more board member That's this evening? Oh, I misunderstood that. Yes, no, no. all right, fine. So then let's take the, the next case and we'll come back to you. I misunderstood what we were up to. So let's try it again. So the next uh, case uh, is 428 Mount Lucas Road, which is block uh, 4201, lot 14 in the RB zone. And it carries the uh, case number Z1616374 V. Well, I'll note for the record that the noticing is in order and the board has jurisdiction to hear the application. So all of the paperwork required from the applicant is in order, is That's that right? correct, for publication and noticing. Yeah. So what I'll get, do is to ask Mr. Bridger to read uh, his minutes into the memorandum. Uh, into the record. And I would suggest that you come and sit down at the table. Mr. Schatzman, would you prefer? I would suggest you come and sit <laughs> yes. at the table where there are two working microphones. Okay. And uh, first of all, it makes it more personal. We can look you more closely in the eyes. <laughs> and secondly, you're more likely to be heard. Yeah. So Mr. Bridger has the first go. Mr. Bridger, I'll just swear you in for the evening. You swear from your testimony this evening will be truthful. Yes, ma'am, I do. Good evening. Uh, the applicants, DMP Private Lending LLC, are the owner, excuse me, applicants Jeffrey Rogers. They're seeking a hardship C1 variance 
and a C2 variance uh, requested to permit the construction of a new single family house on a non-conforming lot. The lot does not meet the required lot area, lot width, or lot frontage. Additional variances are requested for the required setback to height ratio on the right side yard setback. Uh, property is located in the RB zone, is subject to the use and bulk regulations in accordance with sections 10B, 253, 255, and 246 of the former Princeton Township Land Use Ordinance. The existing single family use is permitted as of right. The subject lot is non complying with respect to the required lot area, which is 130,680 square feet. The existing lot area is 45,481. It's not complying with respect to the required 200 foot lot width, the existing is 151. And it's also not complying with the lot frontage, the 200 square foot requirement, whereas the existing is 151. And the subject property is not complying with respect to the following bulk requirements. Uh, the building setback to height ratio, uh, the requirement is 1.5 to 1, the existing it's not complying in the right side yard setback is 35 feet required, existing 16 feet. The applicant is proposing to demolish the majority of the 1,200 square foot, one story single family dwelling and construct a new 3,974 square foot uh, four bedroom single family home. The applicant should address whether they have contacted, contacted any adjoining property owners and either offered to sell the subject property to them or to inquire if they would sell the applicant sufficient lot area to create a complying lot. The proposed single family dwelling will require the following variances. Lot area, the requirements 13680 square feet, the proposed is 45481. Lot width, the requirements 200, the proposed is 151. Lot frontage, the requirements 200, the proposed is 151. Uh, the right yard setback requirements 35 feet, whereas the proposed is 16 feet, and the set the height back requirements 1.5 to 1, and the proposed is 1.1 to 2.18. It's um, requested consideration under both the C1 and the C2 uh, variance criteria. I'd be glad to answer any questions the board might have. We have any questions for Mr. Berger? Derek, what size house from a square footage perspective could this lot um, uh, could be built on this lot as of right? Bear with me a second. Um, there's a proportional FAR which equates to to 12.38% of the required lot area, uh, the lot area of 45,000 square feet. They're building 3,974 square foot house, which is 8.75. Um, I could do the math I, of the, it's probably, I'd, I'd have to calculate it. Um, but the required, they could go up to 12.38% of 45,000, the, the 481. And they're at eight and a half percent instead of the twelve and a half percent. So it's it's not quite at the max. Other questions? Okay. And if you would care to make the case? Yes. Um, we have one witness tonight, Mr. David Singer. Let him be sworn in in accordance with the municipal land use law of the state of New Jersey. I do. Okay, you want to give us your qualifications and what you do and how these plans were prepared, please? Yes, uh, I'm a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, licensed in Pennsylvania by exam in 1988. Uh, graduate of Syracuse University with a Master of Architecture in the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have uh, over 30 years total experience. Uh, I work for the Vaughan Organization, USA Architects, Faraday and Freytag, um, and several other small firms. I'm currently self-employed for the last uh, eight years. And um, uh, I've done much uh, residential work in those last eight years, working for various developers and on projects very similar to this. You haven't appeared before this board before that? Uh, I've not been before this board. I've spoken before, uh, given testimony before uh, Trenton, City of Trenton, 
uh, Township of Lawrence, mm -hmm. Township of okay. Ewing, several other townships north and south. I think we should have no trouble accepting okay. applications. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bridget. I just wanted to respond to Mr. Calvin's question. That would be a uh, 5,680 square foot uh, maximum FAR. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, okay, Mr. Singer, you uh, visited the site? Yes. And you prepared the uh, plans? Yes. And you're somewhat familiar with the municipal land use law of the state of New Jersey? Yes. And the uh, local uh, Princeton development ordinance, correct? Yes. You want to describe the project for us and the board, please? Yes. Um, the, uh, as you can see in your plans, and I have uh, a set of drawings that are identical. There's an easel, and if you can put them up there so we can see them. Do you want to mark any of these um, as yeah, exhibits? I, yeah, you want to descri um, describe the. You can mark it. Describe what you're, what, what's on the easel now, Mr. Singer, please. Uh, currently, uh, drawing ZB1 is on the easel. Um, this drawing uh, summarizes. This drawing summarizes all of the uh, site information uh, that we're required to make available. Summarizes all the site information that we're making available to this board in order to help make a decision. All right. Uh, so, would you mark that A1 and date it 9-28-2016, please? Um, briefly, there's a, a site plan with our proposed development uh, overlaid over the existing footprint of the existing single-family residence. Uh, there's an existing garage detached garage which will remain and we're proposing a breezeway connection we're proposing a six-foot extension into the front yard a uh, new walkway maintain existing driveway uh, and a small patio off the back um, you can see this is our setback line uh, to the adjacent property where the existing building is currently in violation and so we wishing to build up a full two stories will extend that violation. Um, this is just an area map of the township, the general location along, <coughs> along the street. Um, this is the buffer area uh, of the property. Uh, some of the adjacent properties in terms of their situation size can be seen and indicate the difficulty it is for this particular property to meet the minimum area and setback requirements. Um, the other issue with this particular site, and it's not something that shows up on any sort of political map or physical survey, but it's part of the geological conditions of the site are large rock outcroppings. And in fact, the existing house is built over top of one of these very large out rock, crop rock outcroppings. And that probably dictated its current position. Um, this presents the major difficulty of this application. Obviously, there's room within the setbacks to construct what we want to construct and not have uh, the, the setback to height ratio exceed the, the limits prescribed by this uh, by your ordinance well, um, if, if you knocked down the house and did everything in conformance with the ordinance what would the, why would that present a problem or a cold hardship close quote I think I think not knowing where we can build safely without doing extensive rock removal which could in, require blasting which would be another permit <laughs> which would have to get I don't know how we could do it really quietly and I think just the investigation, the subsurface investigation would be expensive because we really would have to excavate and find well, out are we on top of a rock mountain? Is it really possible to even build you, uh, any other location? You made an investigation of the site because you testified you were on the site and you did find that there are on with naked eye a lot of these tremendous yeah. rocks. There's, there's quite a few rock outcroppings. So it's not just, I think, I think the the, the building was located probably in the most expeditious location 
Uh, but you don't know that. Um, <laughs> no, and not I, without extensive. Say, but but we are we are building a residence, and and there is a residence here. There's a residence and, there, and, but and you don't know uh, what else on the property you can yeah, build. Without. If we have to do that, then why why go ahead with the project? Because it's going to be too expensive. Nobody has to do that for any other house. You know, it's uh, just... Well, while you've got that one up, let me ask you a question. You, sure. I've just got it in front of me and I can see it. You've put dotted lines on this diagram, uh, which are the required setbacks for a lot uh, in this district. Yes. I assume. That's what they are. Yes. And... Uh, you've done a, you're going to do a complete knockdown of the existing house. Is that correct? Correct. Well, not a complete. We're going to leave the foundation. The existing foundation will it's remain. That big rock underneath. It told right. You, told me yeah. About. Yes. So, so we would. There's you know, nothing <laughs> above ground that you're going to leave, as I understand. Well, part of the foundation uh, does extend above ground, about three or four feet in the foundation. Yeah. Well, the, the garage is within the dotted line. Um, why is it, I mean, one, some, something you have to convince me about is that why should you be different from other people who come in with an undersized lot and say they want to build a property on it, they t show us the, the, the buildable area and they say, we will put a fully conforming house in that space. Is there something peculiar about this property that prevents you from I doing think that? it's the fact do that I misunderstand my, the diagram? If, if, if we go and find large rocks anywhere else here, it would preclude us uh, the ability to comply. The only, my only concern is you're, you're speculating and, and uh, they're visible. I'm <laughs> it's, it's not unique to this lot. Rock, rock outcroppings in that area of Princeton is not un, are not unique. Mm -hmm. But without doing any sort of minimal soil investigation, then you know, you're just taking it as, as uh, you know, as a fait well, accompli that there's no other place to build a lot that would allow it to conform. We're operating blind, okay, because we don't know what the subsurface conditions are. Exactly. And there's really no way to tell. And let me, let me tell you a story about when I worked in Trenton. Do you know the, the building at the corner of uh, State and Willow? It's uh, currently occupied by some state offices. Right. They did their soil investigations as required because it was state funded. And they found large out rock, crop, rock outcroppings and they had a blast for about a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know because I was working downtown. <laughs> so, you know, rock is not something you want to play around with. No, I, it's I, not, I recognize It's not that. something you can just say, well, just dig over here and it'll be all right. It's no. Just because no, you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> And, and the fact that we do have big, I mean, this is a big rock under here. Um, I think it's just tempting fate and a way just to, you know, pour a lot of money into the ground and not, you know, at some point you're not going to see a return here, okay, unless maybe you live here a hundred years or you inflate the property values that much. But, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that, um, not for not for single family residents. I don't know. Well, is, I, it worth, I, is it worth it to, to live in Princeton and, and do it? Maybe it is for somebody, but I, not not in this application. I, well, I, I I think you know I'm not comfortable, you know, just accepting the fact that there's no other place to build, and because you're asking for, in my opinion, a very significant variance. And as as you know, Chairman Royce said, you know, we've had many many people constantly come to us and build on, on non-conforming lots saying right out we'll conform to all the setbacks and yard requirements and bulk requirements. Um, you're basically saying you don't want to do the investigation to find out if you can do that. Well, can you do some sort of uh, investigation and, uh, like the board asks, if, you know, that won't call that that's a compromise and uh, come back and, and see what we can do and, uh, you know. We could try, uh, I don't know if like a GPR, ground penetrating radar, would give us sort of a, a, an underground profile of 
Well, why don't we talk to a geologist and maybe that's that's the solution to make yeah. the board comfortable? Okay. Well, gossiping I mean, with the geologist is no better than gossiping here. No, I, I mean, mean the geologist facts, with with and with, data, no with, data, with, data, with data with data. Why you shouldn't do what normally people do when they have an undersized lot? We we recognize that it's an undersized lot. You've got required setbacks. And people say we can build in that space, and until Except, until you demonstrate that you can't, uh, what you say is not very useful. I mean, our alternative is to leave the current building there, which is also non-conforming by height. The alternative is to the alternative is to conform to the to the height to setback ratio. I mean, does it, it what what well, how do you feel about the existing building? Because it is non-conforming. It doesn't meet the height to setback ratio now, as I've demonstrated on. Yeah, on your elevation well, sheet, you showed that. But yeah. there's a significant difference between one and a half to one and 1.2 or slightly higher, which is what the well, existing one story is now. Yeah, go it's on. a matter of degree. I mean, we've got a small house. It's a small difference. We want to build a larger house. It doesn't. Survey. It's not an oversized house with a lot. We're certainly under all the other requirements, but we have, we're constricted by, you know, the, the field conditions. So we propose to use the existing footprint and extend it up. That's simply what we want to do. I mean, you already have, you already have a non-conforming condition. We want to extend it. Yes, we'll make it worse, but it doesn't really, it, it's going to certainly improve this house and bring it up to the standard of the other houses in the neighborhood. How close is the house to the side of it? I, I'm noticing how close it is to the to the lot. This line. house Six here and a half feet. is well. This this neighboring lot. This house is way. I mean, it's it's quite far back. No, the house to the right is set back. Um, this house in the front is is. I mean, that lot. There's nothing conforming about this house at all, and. It's right on top of our garage. But where we're located on the lot, we're building as far away from that house as we possibly can because we're on our existing footprint. Um, so the, the small house here on, on lot, what is that? Lot uh, 15. Um, it's a one and a half story. It's a modest house such as this so they're these two are, are currently in in scale but this house will be more in scale with with the other houses that are currently had that have been improved along this uh, stretch of road um, I think the other houses are not really going to be impacted by it I think that it's going to bring it more in conformance with the look of the neighborhood and it's it's certainly you know beneficial by making it cost effective is going to make it affordable so if if we have to yeah, invest a lot of money make it affordable did you say well more affordable i mean if we have to invest look if we have to invest no i'm just a hundred thousand dollars in geotechnical surveys to determine where the rocks are right. that's going to go on the, on the price of the house right, right. i mean but that's not money you can really recover. But a geotechnical investigation, uh, my experience in, in this, and, and uh, I'm an architect, and, and I don't think you'd come anywhere close to $100,000. Well, what if a, we have to do rock removal? Hmm? What if we have to do now, rock removal? we're asking you to do the study first. We're asking you I mean, what if we have a lot of rocks here? Uh, who's going to determine? No. Is this board going to determine that where, where, what's the break point too many rocks were not enough rock, you know what I'm saying? Well, the, you, you, don't, you don't get to that question until you do the study. Uh, I think we need to know where, where we'll stand when we get to that question, because then that will determine whether or not you know. it's, it makes no. sense for us to do you the never study. Know yeah. until you get to the board so. on that one. <laughs> I don't think that's fair, no. No, I think it's well, very fair. I don't think that's fair at all. You don't have to think it's fair. All we're asking for you to do is 
do a do a subsurface investigation and then come back and, and essentially speak to us with facts that this is you know looking around the lot it would be very difficult to conform and then we have at least more information to make a decision all right mr. Schatzman one question for you is your witness going to address uh, I assume the inability to get additional land because yes. we do have a lot area variance here or right. to we sell their lot to somebody yeah the two lot you want to describe that while we're that's in other words well in order in order to get the frontage the width and the uh, lot area uh, you by well we question. just create more deficiencies with the neighboring properties okay the neighboring properties are built up correct yeah they're already improved, so uh, they're not liable to, you know, put themselves in, in a poorer position if they need to add on. And you took a look at the lot in the neighborhood, did you not? Yes. And they're about the same size as this lot? They vary. I mean, some are larger, some are smaller. It's sort of in the middle, you know. And the, house, and the houses are about the same size as the proposal, am I correct? Yes, there are many houses that have been improved to at least this size, if not larger. And the, the house, in your view, as an architect, fits women in the neighborhood, right? Yes. Okay. Mr. Senior, question for you. Is it your testimony that the immediately adjacent lots are undersized? Oh, yeah, lot 15 definitely is undersized. There's no question the about that. How about the other side? I don't have this, the square footage on lot 13. Um, but if uh, how we're we're about see about a third, so we need almost uh, eighty-five thousand square feet. I don't think that uh, lot thirteen, unless it goes back here quite a ways, could could satisfy that. And then we we might create another uh, uh, exacerbate their lot frontage condition because if we don't have 200 feet they certainly don't have 200 feet and if we take out 50 feet and i don't see how we'll get 80,000 square feet out of out of any of our neighbors uh, without buying them out totally and, and taking their development out i mean if that's what you want then that's but that's not the character of this neighborhood you uh, the, the i just want to get the uh I just want to, the applicant wants to say a few words and then I, I, if I have a minute with my client and then we'll be back. Is that okay, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> you, want to, you want to say, you want to be yeah, sworn in? Yeah, you ain't got to be sworn well, in. Well, 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 Who are you in. and be sworn in? If you'd raise your right hand, Mr. Rogers, you swear from your testimony this evening will be truthful. Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jeff Rogers. Um, one of the guys who's working on this project. Um, the issue we have with the stones, uh, if you just physically are on the property, um, when you go into the basement, there's only about half of the basement is dug. The other half isn't dug out deep because there's about a minivan size boulder creeping out of the ground. Um, and I actually know the family that built the house originally back uh, a few generations back. He said that the reason they didn't continue was because of that stone. Um, and they also ran into the same stone when they were doing the uh, garage uh, foundation for where that is. Um, I've also spoken to the neighbor um, on the other side, the lot 13, I think it was, um, who's just been digging out his yard just to kind of change the driveway a little bit and just been massive boulder after massive boulder after massive boulder. Um, if we run into any sort of boulders the size of a minivan that we're dealing with right now, uh, it essentially sinks the project and it's no longer a viable thing. Um, I've had the, a few different builders out there. They've all said, if we have to deal with that boulder, you're looking at ext extreme costs that are gonna sink the project. Um, so that's where I stand with that. That's why we wanted to keep the base, the basement where it was so that we wouldn't run into the problem of digging, finding more stone. Um, initially, we did want to dig a nice deep basement, but every builder we've had in there, everybody says, I'm not dealing with that stone. It's just too big. I mean, if you want to pay for it, you want to run the risk, sure. Um, but it's just not a gamble that we're, we're willing to take there. 
you want to do some sort of investigation to give me more facts and facts, so maybe I can get this. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Sure. So we'll so we'll take your advice. We'll we'll continue it. We'll do an investigation with facts that will you know that you can consider when we you know at, at a, 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 a postponed meeting and see if we a, have a hardship and also we'll have a little bit more information for C2 under uh, Calpin versus Warren Township. So we would ask that the board continue it. We'll give you an extension until um, uh, November's meeting, perhaps. I don't know what the schedule is. November, November right. 9th? Is that? One second. But I think uh, we've tried to say some things about what we believe and you should take those into account. Right. You've got enough space with, within the dotted lines that represent the permitted setbacks on an undersized lot in this region uh, to put a house. And uh, I don't know whether it has to have foundations uh, that are continuous or whether you can build it on stilts or whatever, but I, I don't see uh, when you've knocked down a piece of property, why you can't put on the lot that you've got something which complies? Yeah, it's that's like, just bad architecture. Well, if there's or bad engineering. Yeah, well, if it's extreme topographical condi conditions under the statute, well, then maybe you shouldn't build on the lot. Turn it into a green space. <laughs> Is it acceptable? Well, I think there are alternatives to building on the lot to what you've shown. What we're asking is do a further investigation, look at the overall footprint that you have now, and see if you can configure something that would conform, I guess, one thing within that footprint. Again, you know, again, you have a, a sizable portion or a portion of the house that, that building up would, would require a variance. But you have area between the garage, the breezeway, the existing foundation, and maybe some minimal work on the on additional foundations just look at it all and and because it's i think i think what, what you've come before us to ask given the information you've given us i don't think is is practical for us to make a decision fair enough okay chairman rose is that acceptable then to the board to carry it to november 9th is that correct so we can carry it to the November 9th meeting? And the applicant will not have to re-notice since we're announcing tonight the continued date. I just the wanted to propose... Is ...to notify by regular mail all of the neighbors. Mr. Schatzman, it's the board's practice to ask that when something's carried, um, another notice be sent out by first-class mail, not certified mail. And, and this is a request the board makes. We understand that it's not technically required, but... Fine, that's what you want. And Fine. Chairman Lewis, since I don't know if there are people here tonight who would like to speak, but perhaps we should open it up for comment just in well, case there's anybody here tonight. You can ask tonight. that question at this point, and that will give you some input as well. Is there anyone in the audience who was here to address this case? I see no hands. Right, here's one, Chairman. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Do you wish to make any comment at this time? Yes. Okay, so let's do I'll that. I'll give you an extension, uh, and I also give you an oral extension until November 10th. I'll send Derek a letter confirming that. Good. All right. So can we go back to the case we were going to do first now? Or? No. Well, there's on the seventh and show up, so. Hasn't shown. All right. All right, then, Mr. Schatzman, uh, you're asking the board then to carry this as well to November 9th. November 9th. I don't know if we need an extension. Yes. Okay. I'll give you an extension to November 10th. I'll confirm it in writing with a letter to Derek. I'll send out. Um, I'll send out letters uh, as well by first class mail. Okay. Yeah. One, uh, one owner of a piece of property is in, in New South Wales, Australia, so I'll send an airmail to, to him. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Email is probably even faster. 
What, yeah, he'll probably get it faster than they get it in Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. It's true. Scan it and email it. I didn't understand the relationship of your client who spoke to the property itself. You just said an owner is in Australia. He's the applicant. He's not the owner. He's the applicant. He's, he's, he has permission from the owner to process the application. He's the applicant and the owner is signed a consent on the application to proceed, okay? I wonder, Mr. Chairman, what, what are we looking for in terms of a report on the... Um We're looking for them to come back with a house plan which meets... Uh, no, of, of course, the of course, Royce. setback. And if they can't do that, then they need to have real justification for being unable to meet the setbacks of the permitted. Sure. Do, but do we want to see documentation on the uh, analysis that's done for the property? Yeah, we, we, need, we need some facts. We, we try not to uh, work on speculation. Of course. If, if, if everywhere's got rocks underneath and you've got a really nice sound foundation and you just dig down to the rocks. And build. It's true. <laughs> The way I understand it, we'll try to conform to, as Mr. Collins said, try to conform to the setback lines. We have to go a little bit over or a little bit over, over the setbacks. Little over the setbacks. I think and we can that justify. would be a very bad thing to do. You've got an architect that should be able to design a house that fits on that property. Do an investigation and then make a decision. You've heard what we've had to say. So please do an investigation and then and then look at what you've done and come back to us. Yeah, right. To uh, Mr. Callanan's point, though, a geotechnical investigation by, you know, we don't want to just come back with, uh, give him some okay. direction on the. Right. That's my point. Well, we would like probably, uh, you know, a geotechnical investigation and then some discussion on, on potential for building on the lot by a geotechnical engineer. Okay. Okay. Thank Good. you for your time. We now have another case, so if you could vacate your position, Mr. Tar. What? <laughs> <laughs> Richie. What? About to get it. Mr. Ford, yes. You are recognized. I'll be right back. Excuse yes, me. Yes, we'll, we'll wait a few moments. Okay, we will hear the last case that we have before us this evening, uh, which is uh, 342 Nassau Street, that's block 3401, lot 14 in the RO zone, and the Jugtown Historic District. Um, where is the case number? Why can't I find it? I don't have the number. Uh, yes, it has the following case number. 
Z1616352 UV. And what I will ask is Mr. Bridger to read the essence of his memo, and then Mr. Tarr will take the floor and overwhelm us. Mr. Bridger, before you start, I'll just indicate for the record that the noticing is in order and the board has jurisdiction to hear the application. Thank you. Good evening. The applicant, um, East Ridge Design LTD, is seeking a use variance and minor site plan uh, approval to permit a retail use where such use is not permitted. Um, Excuse me. Uh, it's pursuant to NJSA 40 colon 55D-71, um, a D1 variance is required uh, when a use or a principal structure in a district is restricted against such use. The applicant is seeking approval to permit the establishment of a retail use on the first floor. Um, the current use is a, a interior design office, um, and there's a two-story residential apartment as you face the building to the left. The property is located at the northwest corner of Nassau Street in North and uh, Harrison Street. The lot contains 5,904 square feet are, and is located in the RO zone. The adjacent properties are commercial office buildings, uh, restaurants, grocery store, uh, real estate office, joint occupancy buildings, and single-family uses. Um, the applicant seeking variance relief to permit a sales room in the existing first floor front room. It'll be a 20 by 20 room. The space ser currently serves as a showroom for the interior design uh, business. No internal or external alterations are required. The applicant is not proposing any site improvements, although there's a technical requirement for a site plan. That was all done administratively uh, as a minor site plan. It was re reviewed by the historic uh, Preservation Commission, uh, at which time they installed a new awning, reconfigured the rear porch, replaced the front stoop to the apartments, they added new sidewalks, landscaping, and uh, along the uh, parking area. <coughs> and as far as the zoning, a, a conditional use and uh, site plan authorization was granted in 1979 to permit the conversion of what at that time was an existing two-family dwelling into its con current configuration. A D1 use variance, so whether this was granted in 2003, to permit an interior design firm to utilize the front showroom for retail space, um, retail sales. I have attached the findings of fact to both of these cases uh, to this memo. The use variance um, relates to that it's not permitted on, on this site. Um, they need a D1 use variance. Uh, the parking complies. Applicants should address the, the number of employees on site and the amount of traffic to be generated by the office in the proposed retail use. Uh, <coughs> the retail use is not a permitted use in the RO zone, so there's no parking standard. Uh, the previous variance permitting retail uh, <coughs> use realize, utilized Section 17A279, which provides the following. For any permitted building and uses for which no other requirements are set forth, the appropriate and comparable off-street parking requirements shall be determined by the planning board, taking into consideration the amount of traffic to be generated thereby and the likelihood of all-day or short-term use of the parking spaces. Um, for comparison's sake, the, the parking requirement for retail in the adjoining NB use is one space for every 300 square feet on the ground floor and one space for every 450 square feet on other floors. The application notes a request for a setback variance for a trash enclosure uh, to, be permit, to be permitted closer than the required five-foot setback. Um, the applicant has submitted a survey that indicates the trash enclosure complies with the five-foot setback and the variance is no longer required. The D1 variance must be considered under the following manner. Uh, no variance or other relief may be granted under the terms of this section unless such variance or other relief can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and will not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan and the zoning ordinance. The following items should be considered when reviewing the, the use variance. Uh, the burden of proof, the applicant has the burden of demonstrating special reasons for granting of the variance as well as the negative criteria and uh, special reasons may be found where the proposed use inherently serves the public good, such as a school, hospital, or public housing, where the owner would suffer undue hardship if required to use the property in compliance with the permitted uses in the zone, and where the use would serve the general welfare because the proposed site is particularly suited to the proposed 
proposed use. Um, as you're all are aware, there is a requirement um, of a supermajority for a use variance which requires five affirmative votes. Uh, that's my summary. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to address them. Do we have any questions for Mr. Bridger? No. Thank you, Mr. Bridger. Mr. Tom. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, perhaps we could all be sworn that uh, Katie Eastridge is on uh, my left, Jim Kamal, the engineer, uh, is to my right, and Elizabeth McKenzie, the planner, is in the first row, if we could be sworn. All right, if you don't raise your right hand, do you all swear that any testimony you give this evening will be truthful? Yes. Yeah. And all the paperwork is completed properly. Yeah, I think I do. Good. So we can take jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, what I find fascinating about this case is that uh, back in 2003, the Borough Zoning Board, this board, uh, granted an interior designer who occupied the building uh, a, a use variance for this very purpose to use the 20 by 20 uh, square foot uh, room down on the first floor. Uh, to for retail sales in conjunction with that fellow's interior design business what what you did though that was a little unusual was to limit that uh, variance to his business and his business only um, the, the, the borough board did that a few times over the years um, in my experience it's not the common practice the variances tend to run with the land and here we have an interior designer who wants to do exactly the same thing that the fellow did in 2003 but there was an intervening office use of the building and and so uh, Mr. Bridger's not in a position given the way the, res the resolution was drawn to simply say that it's it was a permitted in the same way that the last fellow was. The, I find that interesting. <laughs> Nevertheless, we'll now proceed. Uh, Mr. Jim Kamalik uh, is a professional engineer licensed in New Jersey who has appeared here before. Uh, he prepared the drawings, and I'd ask that he be accepted as an expert in civil engineering. Certainly. Sure. James Kamalak, C H M I E L A K with Kensho Resources here in Princeton. And sir, are you a licensed professional engineer in New Jersey? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to take a few minutes Bring just to- Bring the microphone a little closer so that uh, I can hear and it will be recorded. <laughs> We'd like to take a few minutes just to um, go over the property location and the site conditions. Um, we've included on the slides, as you can see above, um, a key map which de highlights the property in blue. It's located on the west corner of uh, Harrison Street and Nassau Street. It's an existing historic building uh, in the historic district. Uh, and uh, you can see the location by the blue arrow. Uh, also, this property is located in the RO zone. Um, and you can see that the adjacent zones are uh, the neighborhood business uh, and the R3 that are separated by uh, roadways and intervening lots. Uh, this, this key map is included on your plans as well. Uh, secondly, on slide number three, we've included the overall view uh, of this property on the west corner. And in particular, you can see the subject building highlighted in yellow uh, at the corner of Harrison Street and Nassau Street. Uh, and you can see that uh, this particular property is uh, smaller than the surrounding properties um, and contains the existing uh, historic structure as well as the parking lot to the rear uh, and landscaping sidewalk and porch along the frontage on Nassau Street. Um, this application uh, does not propose any construction activities uh, or substantial disturbance. Uh, the lot, the intention here is to uh, continue the use that was uh, previously undertaken in the same general context, um, but uh, obtain the use variance necessary to do that. Uh, at the rear of the building, uh, you can see on the exhibit uh, the existing parking lot, which is accessed by Harrison Street. 
And if I go to slide four, uh, this lot view, you can see the seven existing parking stalls, which uh, in terms of the number of stalls do comply with the ordinance requirement uh, based on the uses within the building and the floor area. And there is an access driveway uh, from Harrison Street uh, to this parking lot. And the parking lot will remain uh, as gravel. And as Mr. Bridger said previously, uh, there have been some site enhancements uh, to the property that have uh, enhanced the landscaping, some of the walkways, and also included a, um, a nicely fenced in uh, trash and recycling enclosure, uh, which is uh, in the lower left-hand corner, if you're looking at this particular slide of the existing building, um, to efficiently screen the trash cans, uh, and that's also surrounded by landscaping in a in a nice manner. If you've been out to the site and have seen it, uh, it looks very nice. Um, to conclude that um, the, the review of these minor site enhancements uh, were reviewed by uh, HPC. Uh, and the, the review HPC review officer um, did review uh, the compliance plan uh, pursuant to the December 2015 resolution uh, to comply with the conditions of that approval uh, relative to the HPC review um, in the context of a minor site plan. So a lot of the, the site review and, and details of those minor enhancements have already been evaluated, reviewed, uh, and complied with. Uh, and really, we're not here to, to address uh, any additional improvements. So from an engineering standpoint, I really don't have uh, that much more to say. Uh, but we did want to introduce the overall lot, the configuration, how the, uh, the building sits on the property, as you can see on this slide. And I think it's important to point out um, the various uh, setbacks that exist, which are part of the application. Um, relative to the variance relief. We have a side yard setback, a minimum existing non-conforming condition of 1.6 feet, uh, the front yard setback of 10.2 feet, and the side yard setback at 5.1 feet. So the red dashed line shows what the uh, ordinance required setbacks are, and this is just a condition, an existing condition that uh, the property owner uh, just has to deal with, which will be further addressed by our planner uh, in a few minutes. Could I just ask you one question before we take that one off? Is there a handicapped uh, entrance to the building? No, there isn't. No. Okay. Okay. Sorry, you want to consider this Exhibit A1? That would be fine, oh. thank you. That the all four slides, and we'll give a copy to staff. Oh. All right. So we'd like to move on. Uh, uh, Mrs. Eastridge has been sworn. I, I have asked her just to give some background about her practice here in Princeton. Uh, what goes on uh, upstairs with staff or what she proposes in this room downstairs, number of employees, the hours that the facility might be open and things of that sort. Good evening and thank you. My name is Katie Eastridge. I'm an interior designer and my practice has been in Princeton, New Jersey for 28 years. We have enjoyed leasing properties on both two Lane Street and Nassau Street and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to participate in Princeton's history by purchasing the building at 342 Nassau. I'm proud to say that I'm now a steward of a building from 1735 and it's been my intention since the beginning of the purchase to take care of the building and let the next generations make any changes that I have no intention of making. Our interior design practice is small. We do residential interior design. There are two of us that work upstairs and one person that is downstairs. The building is, um, it doesn't really afford many more people working there than just that. It's an incredibly small um, room. The first floor that we would enjoy having a retail showroom 
it allows for a couple of sofas, a dining table or two, art on the wall, and an opportunity for us to visually explain to our customers what it is that we're capable of doing. Great. You're not Thank open you. all the time. The hours? Uh, our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 5, or by appointment. Since I've been there, um, we've had a couple of people drop by every afternoon at best. I can't imagine that we're looking for more than that. Just an opportunity to explain to potential or old customers what it is that we do. <coughs> uh, questions? I guess just where did you do this activity that you plan to do downstairs? Or where do you do it now? What do we do with downstairs now? I, I imagine you do some retail. Not now. Not at all. I'm waiting just until um, potentially I have approval. Am I, yeah, am I answering no, correctly? Sure. Are there, but there are couches and chairs. Oh, we down have, the downstairs. yes. Downstairs right now, it's furnished like a living room. Mm -hmm. And there's a sofa, dining table, uh, a few napkins. Uh, you oftentimes clear? you oftentimes go out to people's homes. We all most of our practice is going to customers' homes. Is that the right answer? Is that the answer? It, it was a simple question. Uh, okay. <laughs> the answer. I've never more, done this before. The answer was more complicated than the question. <laughs> okay, Can sorry. We go to the next slide. Uh, right, so I mentioned earlier that in 2003 the borough board uh, gave Mr. Evans. Uh, the fellow with the Tuscan Hills uh, interior design facility in that building. Uh, the approval that you see uh, on the screen, um, the second floor in his case was office. Uh, the first floor was to be a showroom. Uh, he proposed no changes to the building. There were then and there are now seven parking spaces. Um, uh, Linda Carnival, who had used it before that as a real estate office, testified in 2003 that she thought that it would be a less intense use than her real estate office and uh, um, the uh, number 13 there lucky 13 was the one where you restricted it to his use and his use only and not to go into the future um, and so uh, so that's the, the the facts with respect to the building and with respect to the use um, we have the responsibility to go through the criteria from the ordinance and to do that uh, we've asked Elizabeth McKenzie uh, to uh, act as our planner and to give testimony on that uh, uh, basis so she'll come forward and we'll talk about her credentials there is an easel over there if you want to okay and or use if that. you want to look behind you it's the same uh, they have screens oh, in front so you have a choice um, as to where you want to look. <laughs> um, I can sit here if that's easier. Anywhere that you want. Way, Anywhere that, you like. That way you can stay there. Um, do you want to qualify me first? You just tell them all about it. Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth, middle initial C, McKenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. I am a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. Uh, my office is located at 9 Main Street in Flemington, New Jersey. Um, I have appeared before this board in the not too distant past on the Blue Point Grill application, um, at which time I think you accepted me as an expert. But I'm, if you would like, for brevity's sake, to uh, put a, a copy of my curriculum vitae in on the record. Certainly, you can do that. We will accept you, as Thank we you. did previously. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Like this exhibit A2? Who it is. Okay. Um, in any case, um, just to briefly summarize, I do provide um, planning services uh, both to municipal clients and also to um, applicants appearing before boards as in this case. Um, I don't know if you need more than that on the record. Um, my license is current and I have national certification through the American Institute of Certified Planners. We ask you to be qualified, Mr. Chairman. Is that all right, was. Mr. Royce? Is that all right? <laughs> yes. Good. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Once okay. accepted, you off. can keep on coming back. We're off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
you've already had um, from Mr. Schmelich um, a uh, description of the property and where it's located. If you look at the aerial photograph that is mounted both behind you and also on the graphic display that I have, you can see the property in relation to other properties. Just to, um, to fill in um, what Mr. Bridger uh, described as the surrounding land uses, what struck me about the uses immediately around this intersection was the predominance of design professionals, architects, interior designers, and also real estate offices, which seem to be um, hovering around the corner. Um, and then there are also um, other uses um, as, you, as you move a little bit further away. You have uh, Merrill Lynch, you have a medical office, you've got the firehouse, um, you have uh, residential uses really on both sides of Nassau Street, extending um, east, west, west, east, west of the subject property, sorry, it's on the west side. The There's side also the a public parking lot. Um, yes, so you have, um, so, and then you have over in the area uh, further to the um, east of the subject property, you start to have, you have the um, health food store and you have um, a lot of, um, uh, more retail uh, characteristic uses, but the um, but this is an area where you have a concentration of design professionals. I think that there's a reason for that. The buildings in this area, both uh, the residential buildings in the R3 zone, and then as you get to the um, RO zone, are uh, really lovely old homes that are characteristic. That are the reason this is the um, uh, Jugtown Historic District, and um, and for that reason. Um, they tend to attract people who are willing to have spaces divided up into small uh, offices and to, to deal with, you know, an older home and they like the charm and attractiveness of the older home. So it works for those kinds of offices. Um, and for that reason, I think my client was attracted to this um, particular um, building um, which was erected in the uh, 1730s. Um, the, um, I think what's important about this application is that the use that my client is making of the non-residential portion of what is a joint occupancy building, um, because it has an apartment that is located um, just on the west side and is sort of an annex to the building, um, and then there is the main part of the building is used um, for uh, her use. Um, is that um, she's really? It's primarily an interior designer's office. What she's contemplating and what is proposed in this case is to be able to have on the first floor a, an interior design showroom where clients coming in can get a taste of what her taste is and get a sense of the kind of work she does. The furniture, I was in there today, and the furniture is grouped very tastefully as a sort of dining area and a couple of living area spaces. Um, it's not, it doesn't appear like a retail store. There are not racks. There is nothing um, about it that would suggest um, or that is even proposed to be anything different from really a sort of um, living room type gallery um, setting to show off what she does. But the items that are in there would be available uh, to, for sale to clients who, you know, like that mirror or like that particular couch and, and want to purchase it. And that's um, the reason for asking permission. The RO zone in which this property is located is a, is a residence office zone. It is clearly the intention of Princeton not to allow retail uses, typical retail uses in the RO zone. And I would have a hard time coming before you and saying we want something that is a very typical retail use with a counter and shelves and you know traffic coming in and out throughout the day. That's not the intention here. This is really ancillary to the interior design office um, that my client runs. And it's something that um, uh, is uh, sort of an enhancement of that office and supports the office as opposed to a more traditional retail use where you have a very tiny office and you have um, um, primarily uh, retail sales and the very small office supports the retail sales. In this case, it's pr decidedly the opposite. You have um, uh, the space on the first floor that will show off some of what she does and the kinds of styles that she chooses, um, but the office is the main practice within the building and will continue to be so. Um, the, um, 
the area that we're talking about is roughly 20 by 20 feet. It's sort of divided by a, a wall that comes out, so it lends itself to arranging sort of three separate room areas um, as part of that space, and, and that's how it appears. But the, uh, the benefit of this is that um, there will be um, the ability for, for, um, for people who want to wander in. They see it's a design professional. If they wander in, they will be able to get a sense of what she does, and it will also um, allow um, uh, the fact that they have to have somebody on the first floor to receive people that come in it will give that person um, a function in showing people things and if they're interested in buying them and completing those transactions. Um, the uh, property that uh, we're dealing with uh, has uh, a number of deviations with respect to the placement of the existing building. It's oversized for the minimum lot size requirement in the RO zone, but because of the placement of the home, which was built in the 1730s, um, it does not meet side yard setbacks. That's in part a function of the fact that the, the road, North Harrison Street, was widened um, uh, after this house was built. And in fact, the annex that's now on the west side used to be on the east side. Um, and the, the house also sits uh, 10.2 feet off Nassau Street. So there are some existing deviations associated with the lot, the lot coverage, um, the building coverage rather, the building height, the floor area ratio, all of those parameters are met. So the lot is not in any way overbuilt. We do need C variances for the um, existing setback deviations, but I think they can easily be justified as C1 variances, and the only way to cure them would be the removal of the existing building or the relocation of the existing building, and given its presence in an historic district, um, I think that that would do more harm than good to the neighborhood and to the intent and purpose of your zone plan. So that is the testimony I'm going to offer you on the C variances. We have no other um, new variances, C variances, or design waivers. All we have is the D variance to allow the designer showroom because of the terms and conditions of that resolution from 2003 that you saw that specifically state that um, the uh, variance that was previously granted for a, uh, a showroom uh, was limited to that particular um, uh, professional's use of the space. Um, in this, I, and I, I have to say that looking at the, your intentions for the RO zone and you know, looking at the criteria that we have to satisfy um, with respect to granting a D variance, we have to demonstrate that there are special reasons that justify granting the variance in this particular case, which I'll get to in, in a moment. But we also have to deal with the negative criteria, the effect of granting the variance on the intent and purpose of your zone plan and zoning ordinance. And also we have the enhanced burden of proof imposed um, by the um, Medici decision, um, wherein there's a presumption that if a use um, has been consistently not permitted um, under the zoning ordinance, um, that that is an intentional omission of that use from the list of those permitted in the zone. There's no question in my mind that the RO zone is not intended for retail uses, in large measure because it encompasses a lot of historic buildings and um, it was, there's a recognition that maybe those historic buildings are located in an area with a more commercial atmosphere, so the office uses are allowed, but the intention is not to um, have an expansion of sort of the retail nodes that are located along Nassau Street. Um, that is very clear, um, but I think in this particular case, um, if we look at the nature of the showroom use um, that is contemplated, it, it's quite limited and it's clearly ancillary and accessory to the use of the premises for an interior designer. It is not intended to be a separate or independent retail use. In fact, we're not asking for retail use as a sort of uh, broad uh, category. We are asking to have a designer showroom that does allow items to be sold if people are interested in buying them. Um, the, um, but I looked at your provision in your 2003 resolution, which limited it to the particular property owner, and it occurred to me that that was an action on the part of the board, which, while somewhat irregular in the use variance world, 
made sense, I think, from the board's perspective in the desire not to have over time and with changes in occupancy of the building, not to have something that was granted as a very limited um, type of uh, retail or showroom activity in connection um, with the design professional's office, not to have that morph over the over the over changes in occupancy into something that really was an independent retail use. And so I could understand the boards taking that position and I think that we can achieve that in this case um, uh, by simply carefully describing uh, what is contemplated and the fact that it is clearly ancillary and accessory to having an interior designer's office on the premises, that it would be a showroom associated with that. Um, and I think you can achieve the same kind of objective and make it clearly enforceable by the zoning officer. I think that fear that might have motivated that original condition can probably be overcome in another way. But nevertheless, I think that's why we're here tonight. You want to know that whatever we're doing here doesn't go far from what you had um, originally approved or is in fact exactly what you had originally approved in 2003 and uh, I was sympathetic to that because it's often something a board wrestles with in terms of something getting out of hand over over a period of time um, I think that in terms of the special reasons uh, that justify granting um, the variance in this case um, we do have um, a number of purposes of the municipal land use law that I think are promoted by granting um, the variance. Um, I would cite specifically uh, purpose A, which talks about promoting um, or encouraging municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of all lands in the state in a manner that promotes um, the public health, safety, and general welfare. And I would, I would venture to say that as your ordinance provides, this site in particular is a very appropriate site for a design professional um, and that this proposed uh, use would be accessory to that um, and would, would support the, the appropriate uh, use of this property for a low intensity type of office use. And I think that that's important because it is at a busy intersection. So I think having it a, the same low intensity office use that's contemplated um, in this case that the applicant actually has on the site is appropriate. Um, purpose G talks about providing sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of uses, including commercial uses. But again, that goes to the appropriateness of this particular site for exactly the use that is contemplated here. And uh, Purpose I talks about promoting a desirable visual environment through creative development techniques and good civic design and arrangements. We're not proposing any changes to an historic building um, other than the site improvements that were already previously and by the way, unanimously approved by the Historic Preservation um, Commission to upgrade the site to change the, uh, instead of getting having concrete walkways to, to have uh, herringbone brick and bluestone walkways and, and uh, steps and things of that nature. Um, Are you saying there will be no signage on the building? The signage that's on the building is the signage that is already on the building. That won't change? That will not change. Okay. No additional, there's nothing going to be advertising items for sale store, none of that will be there. It just the um, this, the signage that is currently yes, there the on the building will the, remain. No, yes, I'll, exactly. I'll add that there's no signage with respect to retail sales, but there's the HPC is approved and we're waiting for a sign permit for a ground mounted sign. That, at, uh, at excuse the me, I stand corrected. That sign hasn't been installed. All the other improvements are in, but that sign that was approved by HPC has not yet been installed, but all it is is an identification sign. It's not, it has nothing to do with, you know, items for sale or anything. That's, you know, the, the, the way that um, my client proposes to handle the sales is really to have just, um, uh, you know, very discreetly hidden um, prices on things. And, um, and also, there will be no cash register. There's just a little card reader. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nondescript. We have a copy of that sign? That's been approved. Yeah. I yeah. I probably have a sign? copy of it if you want from my file. I, I think we've got it on the screen. I think we have a slide of it. Okay. There it is. 
Okay. Eastridge Design uh, Home. Okay, that's on the site drawings. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I will make that exhibit A four, or it's within the. It's within the slide set. Is the is the aerial exhibit that uh, yes, that's all slide. part of the Paris? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then finally, the other purpose. Uh, is purpose J, which talks about preservation of historic sites. I think what is contemplated here is entirely, in terms of the, the, um, the use that is occupying the building, is entirely consistent with the historic district, as well as with the RO zone, with the only provision being the permission uh, the applicant is seeking to be able to sell some of the items that she's displaying for customers to see. Um, in terms of the negative criteria, I've already talked to you about what I think are the intentions of the RO zone, why this was limited to one particular um, uh, applicant in the past, um, and the fact that I think we can achieve those objectives um, with this application. Um, and I think that um, is an indication that we will not be violating the governing body's intent with respect to the RO zone, um, and thereby we're satisfying the enhanced burden of proof with respect to uh, the Medici decision. I don't think there's going to be any detriment to the public good um, if the variance is granted. Um, this site will remain exactly as it looks today, with the exception of the sign, which has not yet been installed. Thank you for correcting me on that. So I think um, on balance, um, the granting of this variance satisfies the statutory criteria for granting a D variance. And, uh, and, and the applicant is, is you know, willing to have the record reflect the, um, the uh, nature of the use and the fact that it is ancillary to the, uh, the interior design business. Not, not to beat the sign up here, but do we have that in the pa our package, or you just have it on the screen? This, uh, the si excuse me. The sign was part of the uh, HPC submission, so I do have it on the screen. But if you'd like to see it on a sheet, I, ha I can provide that as well. Would like to see yeah. it. It's not in the sheets that we were provided. The, that uh, it's an interesting procedural process we've been through. Uh, H we had an administrative approval and HPC review of all of the exterior changes which have already occurred that th this application is characterized as a site plan and use variance but only because a use variance in a commercial building in Princeton must also be a site plan we're not doing any site plan work it's a site plan application with no work all of the things you see there were approved by HPC that's fine where do you have the site do you have the sign located on your site drawing um. on the HPC plan, uh, SL1, which is on the screen. Because I don't see it on the site drawing. Where is it? With it's with the dark the line plan? on the plans that are up there. Your uh, cursor. OK. Yeah, it should have been part of the package to us, but uh, yeah, it's right here. Oh, okay. Um, here it is. So you are doing okay. additional. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So that solid, um, in the detail view, the lower right hand corner, that solid black short line in the front of the building, that's the sign. Correct. And it is located outside of uh, the site triangle at that location. These, show, these drawings show the, si the sign and the location. It should have been part of the package to us. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was also doing landscaping you work too. Use the cursor on the computer. You can highlight the location on the slide you've got up at the moment. Is there a cursor? I'm just not sure how to make the cursor work. I'm trying, but um, won't go. Okay. Yeah, it's not working. But it, it's obvious where it is. But it's in that lower right-hand corner, that heavy black line yeah. there. Pa it's exactly parallel to Nassau Street. There's one other point I want to mention in my testimony that I neglected to mention, and um, it was brought up in Mr. Bridger's, Bridger's report, and that is the um, issue of parking on whether um, this, you know, proposed designer showroom might, you know, create a need for more parking. Um, right now we have seven parking spaces on the site. We meet the requirements for um, 
uh, the office use and for the residential um, uh, apartment space that is um, in the uh, annex. And in addition, um, we have sufficient parking so that even if you treated this as a full retail space, which you're, we're not asking you to do, but even if you were to, we would have sufficient parking. Um, there will be, uh, in connection with the business itself, um, not more than three people associated with the business, um, two upstairs and one down, um, and then two spaces are required for the dwellings. We actually, you know, only on a day-to-day -day basis, only five spaces are required. There are seven spaces on the site. But there is also a public parking space across Nassau Street. That is correct. Behind the graves. That is uh, true. That is correct. But even without you using that, we have the space on site. Yeah. Okay. If, if any so questions okay. of the planner? We have the audience. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address this case? Are you here to address this case at all, or just out of curiosity? Oh, we can have a bed and breakfast. Okay. The one on Cherry Hill Road that carried. Different case. Sorry? They're here for a different case, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. There's nobody here that's speaking. No, no. Um, that's it. That's it. Um, <laughs> the, the, to, to me, the number 13 is the only one that's, that's uh, unusual. I think we've made a case to continue a use that had previously taken place within the space. Um, you would like this to continue with the building rather than, as I did last time, have it only well, one? Well, <laughs> this costs thousands of dollars and lots of time, and, and it would just it's the way the borough did its business, but it's contrary to what uh, Cox and others tell us we normally do. And so it just there are other cases that are going to come before you that will uncover some old practices. It won't affect this Eastridge. It's just maybe good practice if you if you thought about it. If you don't want to do it, it's not going to hurt her. But you, we would like you to approve the 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 uh, use, the retail use. And thank you, Mr. Tar. Question for you in terms of the conditions. Uh, based on any board approval. The resolution from 2003 describes this as a variance for the specific occupancy of the first floor of the joint occupancy built by low intensity interior design showroom for the retail sales of, and then it explains, yeah, textiles, I assume, furniture, uh, with no structural alterations or exterior changes, uh, hours of operation, this says 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesdays through Saturday with the show to be closed on Sundays and Mondays. Uh, I believe your client testified actually her hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. I'm not sure if that matters to the board or not. Um, but I'm assuming that from your client's perspective, those conditions are acceptable yes. to uh, approval that might be forthcoming tonight. Sure. The, the, this fellow had limited hours. She has limited hours, a limited type of retail sales, limited type of retail sales. It's astonishing, but it's almost exactly the same as it was in 2003. I, I, I don't disagree that it would be uh, typical that a use ferrets would run with the land. So that's why I was asking questions about what conditions would you put on it uh, so that were the property to be sold, it would be clear what's permitted out there and what is not. So that if it changes hands, uh, you know, there aren't too many uses that would be similar to an interior design. I suppose anyone could try and argue what their, you know, whatever their use is. The historic similar. district doesn't put constraints on immediately. I don't. I not necessarily. I, not on the interior use. I mean, they. The representation is that they have come to HPC and have received approval for the well, I mean, the, the so. approval we're being asked for seems to be fairly trivial from the viewpoint of zoning. We granted it before, and uh, but it, it only ran with the particular person. Now we're being asked to make it run with the building. That well, reduces the hazard that if the building changes, uh, 
it, it, it might be different in terms of its retail use. But. Well, right now, the resolution from 2003 states there won't be any structural alterations or exterior changes. And certainly, the exterior change couldn't happen without HPC approval because it is in an historic district. Um, I think the difference for the applicant, what they're asking the board to do that's different, is simply it was approved in 2003 for design to a design office, but it was limited to that particular owner and tenant. Mm -hmm. So the request, that, that's why this owner's back, because they had to come back. They couldn't operate under the prior resolution, given its language. And what they're asking you this time is, would you allow it to run with the land, which is uh, normally how a variance would operate. It will run with the land. So. I, my, my thinking is we might be able to do that. I think the wording of the old 203, um, the lead in to the conditions is, is, is not consistent where it only grants a variance, but then in part A, it really describes a limited variance. And if, if you call in, in the lead in section that we grant a limited variance as defined in part A, in my thinking that works and that could run with the land. Mr. Tarr, I, I, I think we're all on the same page. What Mr. Floyd is saying is that he, he likes the wording in paragraph A of the 2003 resolution, and I think that that is consistent with what you're asking for tonight. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. It, so. it, I've got a planner on either side of me saying, you know, these, this is an accessory use to the, to the primary use within the space. The, the zoning officer deals with this five times a day people come in and say I want to do this yeah. in a building where and and that's his job to interpret the ordinance to determine whether that successive user is falls under the umbrella of the the, the one that was approved our problem was that this the, the, the earlier guy would cut off so there was nothing to piggyback yeah. on and I, I mean I think it makes sense that uh, if the board approves it, the resolution would make clear that it is accessory to an interior design office, that there's not going to be a freestanding showroom should the property change hands. Exactly right. So, I think so we, can, be, we can frame yeah. that once decided. So let us, let us decide what we want to do. And uh, we've incorporated, it seems to me, paragraph A of the previous one into whatever we say we're up to. Basically, it will run with the property unless there's a change in intensity of use or something like that. So what do we think? I mean, this seems reasonable. I think I'm very comfortable with it. It's yeah. consistent with previous approvals, and uh, I have no problem with Any it. Any other comments? I think... I support it, you know, you support it? You due to the, the very low intensity of the use, mm -hmm. which is what the town wants. So it's, it's the benefit. You could probably have a higher office use that would exceed that activity. So I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tunnelman, any comments? I, I support it. Okay. I was thinking, when I first saw this, I was thinking of the Michael Graves offices that were, I think it's the more right more adjacent to it on the same side. I think it's got a showroom That's downstairs right. in which you can buy some yeah, of his stuff. There one on the first floor. Yep. I don't know. Still I don't there. Think he's in the confinement team across the street. But at any rate, well, he, 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 he's this, got, this seems quieter to me <laughs> than anything. If, yeah. that's our, if that's our concern. Yeah, I think there's an analogous one in the Graves. Yeah. Okay then. So we need a motion and a seconder, and we can vote. I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, application, and obviously concurrent, uh, consistent with uh, with running with the land. Mm -hmm. Okay. The seconder for that motion. Second. Do we have a motion and a seconder? You want to call the roll for us? 
Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Colson? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Mr. Calvin? Yes. Mr. Timmerman? Yes. Chairman Royce? Yes. Thank you. It's approved. Thank you very much. Good. All right. So I don't think we have any other business, so we are adjourned. Congratulations. Until next month. <laughs>